Good morning, welcome to Sunday morning. My name is David Kenny, and I'm the pastor here at Walden Community Church. And I would just like to start by asking if you feel overwhelmed by the financial responsibilities of everyday life. In fact, are you trying to make your dollar stretch just to the end of the month, and you're worried that you're not putting any money aside for your future? You're not saving for your retirement. If that's you, you are not alone. The vast majority of Americans are not saving for their retirement. And according to one survey, 35% of all adults in the US only have a couple hundred dollars in their savings, and 34% have zero savings. Is that bad? Is that good? Look at what Jesus says about saving for a rainy day in the Sermon on the Mount. Matthew chapter 6, verse 19, do not lay up for yourselves treasures on earth, where moth and rust destroy, and where thieves break in and steal. But lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven, where neither the moth nor rust destroys, and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. I think that if Jesus were here now, in 2021, and he was going to say, this same teaching, give us this same lesson, he would say, uh, do not lay up your money in the stock market or where medical bills will one day destroy, but rather you need an eternal retirement plan where the stock market never crashes and where medical bills will never destroy. Jesus is contrasting two different approaches to our retirement. There are earthly investments and there are eternal investments. And just like any good financial advisor, Jesus points out the dangers in investing your treasure here on earth. Jesus says that is a poor investment. Why? Well, because an earthly investment would be temporary. It's all gonna pass away. You know, right now, financial advisors uh, will encourage you to diversify. That's uh, an important strategy in investing. Diversifying means that you are spreading out your wealth. You don't have it all just in one place. Don't just buy stock in Apple. Also invest in bonds. Also invest in low-tech companies and in precious metals. Why would you do that? Well, if something horrible happens, then diversifying assumes that some of your wealth will go away. Some of your wealth will get lost. The stock market may crash. The annuity might go lower. Your 401k might just become 401. <laughs> so you diversify. And that reduces the odds that you'll lose out as much. And that's the best we can do with the stuff that we have down here. Just spread it out so we don't lose as much when things all go to pot. Psalm 39 verse six says, man is a mere phantom. As he goes to and fro, he bustles about, but only in vain. He heaps up wealth, not knowing who will get it. Proverbs 23 says, do not wear yourself out to get rich. Have the wisdom to show restraint. Cast but a glance at riches and they are gone. For they will surely sprout wings and fly off to the sky like an eagle. Jesus teaches in his most famous sermon, and he takes this same idea, but he takes it one step further. He assumes that your wealth could be lost. Something's going to eat it, right? He says moths are going to come, or either that people are going to sneak in while you're asleep and they're going to steal it. It's like the contents of a refrigerator when you have teenagers in your house. Something's going to eat it. You might think you have cookies, you might think you have Hot Pockets, but if you aren't watching, someone's going to creep in and take them from you. Look at what Peter and Paul say. 1 Peter 2, Dear friends, since you are foreigners and temporary residents in the world, I'm encouraging you to keep away from the desires of your corrupt nature. These desires constantly attack you. Paul says in Philippians, Brothers and sisters, imitate me and pay attention to those who live by the example we have given you. I have often told you, and now tell you with tears in my eyes, that many live as the enemies of the cross of Christ. In the end, they will be destroyed. Their own emotions are their God, 
and they will take pride in the shameful things they do. Their minds are set on worldly things. We, however, are citizens of heaven. Peter and Paul both make the same argument. They say, we aren't even residents. We don't even live here. You don't live here. So if you don't live here, don't invest here. This is not your home. Why was this so important for Jesus to teach in his most famous sermon? Well, because he tells you. He says, for where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Tell me, what is your favorite bank? What's your favorite bank? It's probably going to be the bank that has your money, right? That's your favorite bank. What stocks do you care about? The only ones you bought. Do you care about your neighbor's house? Do you care about your neighbor's car? Do you care about your neighbor's kids? No, just yours. My heart lies with my investments. And you care about here because your heart is here. Jesus knew that as soon as you invested, as soon as you opened up an account, as soon as you bought stock, then a tiny piece of you would be attached to it. We give a tiny piece of ourselves away when we bury our treasure. Jesus goes on and he gives us an example. He says in verse 22, the eye is the lamp of the body. So if your eye is healthy, your whole body will be full of light. But if your eye is bad, your whole body will be full of darkness. If then the light in you is darkness, how great is the darkness? It seems like a very strange teaching at first. But when we think about people and how they lived back then, the things that they thought about, uh, it kind of opens this passage up. First of all, uh, they, they believed back then that your eyes were kind of like flashlights. They, they would actually emit light. You know, if your eyes are closed, it's dark. But if you open your eyes, light comes in. And they kind of assumed that that meant that, well, light emanated from your eyes. Second, the Greek word for body is the word soma. But it doesn't just mean your physical body. It means your everything. It means your personality. It means your person. It means all of you. And your head, where your eyes are, right, was actually the source that they believed for your emotions and your feelings. And today we kind of, we, we say it's our heart. We, we feel with our heart. But back then they used to feel with their head. So Jesus talks about investments and burying your treasure and how a tiny piece of your heart gets buried with that treasure. And he gives us some advice about how to live. He says, if your eye is generous, then your whole body will be generous. If your eye is stingy, then you'll act stingy. And then he gives us a warning. So why can't we live this way? We're asking Jesus, right? We're asking Jesus that question. Why can't I live that way? He says in verse 24, no one can serve two masters. For either he will hate the one and love the other, or he'll be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and money. And when we read that, we kind of almost read it like it's a dare. <laughs> Jesus says, I can't serve two masters, but he's wrong. I can. I'm super great at multitasking. Maybe back then people had trouble with money and investing and generating wealth, but I have it under control. Why does Jesus say this though? Why does Jesus say that you can't serve God and money? Because he thinks you can't do it? No, because he doesn't want you to do it. Why doesn't he want you to do it? Because wherever your treasure is, there your heart is also. And only God should have your heart. Only God should have your worship, right? This is about worship. Make no mistake. Jesus is talking about worship. See, we want to walk this thin line between God and money. And we challenge God. We test God. We think that we can serve both. And God says, I don't want you to serve both. Don't you see? Your heart should belong only to me. We're talking about getting a reset this summer, pushing the button 
and realigning where things go, how we act, how we think. And I think we should reset our priorities. Last week, we talked about the kingdom of heaven. That was one of Jesus' favorite talking points. And in Matthew chapter 13, Jesus has two very short parables that basically teach the same lesson. Jesus says, The kingdom of heaven is like treasure, hidden in a field which a man found and covered up. Then, in his joy, he goes and sells all that he has and buys that field. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant in search of fine pearls, who, upon finding one pearl of great value, went and sold all that he had and bought it. What is the moral to the story? The kingdom of heaven is worth everything to obtain. And so, the kingdom of heaven costs everything to obtain. Have you ever had two bosses? I mean, Jesus warns about serving two masters, but have you ever had two bosses? I mean, you had a supervisor and your supervisor had a boss and both of them would talk to you and tell you what to do. Did you like that? It's not fun because you're constantly trying to please two different people who want two different things. They pull you in two different directions, and you're only one person. Well, by now, if you've sat in church for as many years as most of us, you know that if a preacher starts his sermon talking about money, then you can bet he's probably going to close that sermon talking about tithing and giving. Malachi is the most famous passage about tithing, Malachi chapter 3. But I think it's also important for what we're talking about today. Malachi 3 verse 6 says, For I, the Lord, do not change. Therefore you, O children of Jacob, are not consumed. From the days of your fathers you have turned aside from my statutes and you have not kept them. Return to me and I will return to you, says the Lord of hosts. But you say, how shall we return? Will man rob God? Yet you are robbing me. But you say, how have we robbed you? In your tithes and contributions, you are cursed with a curse, for you are robbing me, the whole nation of you. Bring the full tithe into the storehouse, that there may be food in my house, and thereby put me to the test, says the Lord of hosts. If I will not open the windows of heaven for you and pour down for you a blessing until there is no more need, I will rebuke the devourer for you so that it will not destroy the fruits of your soil and your vine in the field shall not fail to bear, says the Lord of hosts. Then all nations will call you blessed, for you will be a land of delight, says the Lord of hosts. Tithing is one of those dividing issues with Christians. God has two sons, one who is legalistic, obedient, and who follows every line and word to the letter, and there is another son who is more free-spirited and tends to kind of wash everything away in forgiveness. So where do we stand on tithing? Are we free to give what we want from our heart? Or are we literally bound to 10% before taxes? Well, didn't Jesus come to do away with the law? Mm. Jesus said that he didn't come to abolish the law. He said he came to fulfill it. Yeah, but if the law is fulfilled, then that means it's no longer active. Perhaps. But we keep bringing up a lot of Old Testament laws, especially the Ten Commandments. In fact, when we read the New Testament, it says the church freely gave. When we read those early church stories, the church doesn't seem legally obligated to give. They give and they help because they want to. And Jesus does teach on giving and money a lot. So what are we supposed to do? Or, better yet, what does God want us to do? In Mark chapter 12, the Bible says Jesus sat down opposite the treasury and he watched the people putting money into an offering box. And many rich people put in large sums. And a poor widow came and put in two small copper coins, which make a penny. 
And he called his disciples to him and said to them, Truly I say to you, this poor widow has put in more than all those who are contributing to the offering box. For they all contributed out of their abundance, but she, out of her poverty, has put in everything she had, all she had to live on. What does Jesus want? Does he want our money? Does he want our 10%? Jesus watches a widow put in all the money she has to live on, and he doesn't stop her. He doesn't say, ma'am, no, 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 no. You take this back. You need this. Instead, he commends her. He commends her obedience. He commends her faith. So obviously, the point of this passage is the faith of the widow to give what she had even out of her poverty. She trusted God. It's a beautiful picture of trusting God and knowing that God will provide. And Jesus' response to this act demonstrates God's feelings toward our sacrifice, toward our generosity. The dollar amount was not the issue, especially when he talks about the rich man. You know, another interesting thing about this story, and I really never even thought about it until I sat down to actually write this out, In this story, Jesus is watching. Jesus sat down opposite the treasury box to watch people give. We think that nobody sees how much or how little when we give to his church. God sees, doesn't he? He is watching. How much? Do Christians give to the church? In the United States, Christians give about an average of 3% of their income. 3%. So I guess we all agree (laughs) that God doesn't want 10%. (laughs) But notice what the passage of Malachi says. You are robbing me. But you say, how have we robbed you? And God answers, bring the full tithe into the storehouse. God says, bring the full tithe, the full tithe, the full 10%. And he says, if you don't, God says, then you are robbing me. Why would God need to say this? Right? Why was this written down? Because it was happening. Even back then, even then in the days of Malachi, people were not tithing. They were not giving a full 10%, even back then. And it's not always money. The tithe covered many things. Followers of God were supposed to sacrifice clean animals. They were supposed to bring the first fruits of their crops and 10% of their wealth. So where do we fall? What do we believe about the tithe? Malachi 3 begins with the passage, For I, the Lord, do not change. What does God care about? in this passage. Money? Or obedience? But he also makes a very strong claim. He says his followers are stealing from him. Right? Them strong words. And, And this isn't just anyone making this claim. This is your heavenly father. This is God. Look, I can't tell you what God wants from you. Does God want something? Of course. Does he need 10%? I don't know. But I'll tell you what. He certainly needs my obedience. And I need to sit with myself and I need to ask myself that. Am I obeying God with my giving? Only you can be the best answer to that. And perhaps, if it's possible, could you trust God more with your giving? Could you be more obedient with your giving? Hey, what if it were us? What if it were you and me? What if 
you knew someone was stealing from you. And it was a person that you knew. A person that you knew was stealing from you. Would you say that they loved you? I think more important than 10% of our income is that we are called to give God our first and our best. Proverbs 3 says, Honor the Lord with your wealth and with the first fruits of all you produce. Then your barns will be filled with plenty and your vats will be bursting with wine. The wisdom literature says, Honor God with your first. In fact, let's look at the very first recorded offering, Cain and Abel, in the book of Genesis. Genesis chapter 4. Now Adam knew Eve, his wife, and she conceived and bore Cain, saying, I have gotten a man with the help of the Lord. And again, she bore his brother Abel. Now Abel was a keeper of sheep, and Cain a worker of the ground. In the course of time, Cain brought to the Lord an offering of the fruit of the ground, and Abel also brought of the firstborn of his flock and of their fat portions. And the Lord had regard for Abel and his offering, but for Cain and his offering, he had no regard. So Cain was angry and his face fell. Why? Right? We read this and we ask why? Does God like ranchers and not farmers? That's, that's a whole nother debate. And theologians will go back and forth about why they assume uh, God was pleased with Abel and not Cain. Because the text never says. Or does it? What did Abel bring? The Bible says, the firstborn of his flock. What did Cain bring? The Bible says, an offering. It was something. That's true. But it wasn't his first. Hey, it's not much, but it's something, right? It's better than nothing. It's better than most. What do I usually do? I get my check, and then I remove my rent money, and then I remove my car payment, and then I take out my groceries, and then I pay my bills, and then I fill my car with gas, and then I write a check to the church. But the Bible says first, Exodus 23, the best of the first fruits of your ground you shall bring into the house of the Lord your God. Why? Why do we give God our first? Because God gave you his first? 1 Corinthians 15 says, But in fact, Christ has been raised from the dead. The what? The first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. See, the problem is, we, we, we read this and we think, Nah, <laughs> that's not going to work. The, the way I'm doing it now, this works. God's happy, I'm happy. Because most of us are convinced. We don't think we can live on 90% of our income. Is that so? You know, a pastor once said, I would rather live on 90% blessed by God than live on 100% cursed by God. You know, in the back and forth debate of whether Christians should tithe, we often miss something in that Malachi passage. God says in verse 3, test me in this. If I will not open for you the windows of heaven and pour out for you a blessing until it overflows. Did you know that this is the only verse in the Bible where God says, test me? Every other place in the Bible, it says, do not test God. Do not put the Lord your God to the test. This is the only exception. Plus, God not only tells us that it's okay to test him, but he encourages us to do it. He says, do what I ask you to do about giving, and then you see if I do not bless you beyond anything imaginable. Now, is God saying that tithing is a guarantee that you will be financially prosperous? And if that were true, then tithing wouldn't be an act of giving. It would be an investment. So that's not what God is saying. Is God saying that if you tithe, then it's kind of like insurance? 
that ensures that you'll never get fired and that the stock market will never crash? No, tithing is not insurance. But what God is saying is, over the long run, the person who tithes, who gives to God obediently, who gives their first fruits, will be more blessed financially and in every other way over the person who disobeys. That's what he's saying. If you want to be blessed by God, then you obey God. If you don't want to be blessed by God, then disobey. And God says, test me. Test me that your 90% will go further than your 100%. Do you remember when Jesus was at Mary and Martha's house? One daughter was working and following the rules, and the other daughter was a little more relaxed and free. Martha got mad and told Jesus to tell Mary to help her. And in Luke 10, Jesus says, Martha, Martha, you are worried and upset about many things, but only one thing is needed. Mary has chosen what is better, and it will not be taken away from her. The one needed thing that Mary understood had nothing to do with legalism or rule following, but rather it was her attention to Jesus. Mary chose to invest in sitting close to Christ. And Jesus said, she chose wiser and that no one could take that investment away from her. Investing where it matters. That is the way to make sure that your life is not wasted. To make sure that you live a life that matters. In the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus says, if we invest in heavenly things, our wealth will go further. See, Jesus isn't interested in getting a bunch of people to be wise and moral. He is looking to get a bunch of followers who are that way because they're already changed on the inside. Jesus says that investing in what matters gets your heart in the right place. I mean, have you ever used that phrase, eh, my heart's just not into this? My heart's just not into this. My, my, uh, what does that mean? <laughs> when someone says, oh, my heart's just not into this, what does that mean? Well, if you're at a job, it means that you're not doing your best. It means if you're in a relationship, then you're not really interested in making it work. If you're in a meeting, probably means you're distracted and you're not giving your full attention. If you're in the choir or in the band, then you're probably not playing the right notes. If you're parenting, you aren't really concerned about your kid's future. If you're a leader, it means you're okay with phoning it in. If you're a follower, it means you're willing to let other, somebody else carry the heavy stuff. And in your spiritual walk, it means you're not really giving God the first place in your life. Yet Jesus tells us that the greatest commandment starts with love the Lord your God with all your heart. What we all need is some way to get our hearts in the right place. And that's part of what Jesus is telling you to do. This is why Jesus says, do not store up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal, but store up for yourselves treasure in heaven where moth and rust do not destroy and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Jesus says that your heart is where your treasure is. In little ways, parts of your heart are scattered all over the world. There's a little piece of your heart in the city where you grew up. There's a little piece of your heart buried deep in the dirt where your first elementary school stood. There's a piece of your heart in your childhood at home, probably in your very first bedroom. We probably left a piece of our heart with the very first person we ever kissed and the last. We make deposits of our treasure in life and become broken because of it. <laughs> We've left our hearts in places. 
Your heart is somewhere. And it's where you put your treasure. I want you to challenge yourself and take a look at yourself and ask where your heart is this week. Should it be where it is? Is your heart first given completely to God? And then are you investing in eternity? Or is it all tied up in places and things that probably won't last? I don't want you to be concerned about tithing or 10% or legalism. I want you to be able to confidently say that God has your treasure because God has your heart. Living a life that matters means that you are investing in what matters. Put your treasure where it needs to go. And then your heart will follow. Let's push the reset button on where our heart belongs. Let's push the reset button on what we think about investment and our treasure. And if we're obeying God with the first of our giving. If we can think honestly about our hearts and our giving, then perhaps investing our treasure in the right places will help our heart to be in the right places too. Let's close our time in prayer. Lord, we thank you for this opportunity that we have to gather. We thank you that we are free to worship, free to love, free to embrace these teachings. We thank you for them. We thank you for Jesus, the Sermon on the Mount, that continues to teach us and tell us the direction and the way to go. But more importantly, it teaches us your heart, the things that you care about. Lord, we want our heart to be your heart. We want our eyes to be your eyes. We want our giving to be inspired by you. So we ask that we would become more obedient, that we would become more faithful, and that we would invest our treasure invest our time, invest our talents in heavenly things where moth and rust do not destroy and where thieves do not break in and steal. And Lord, if there is a heart issue in me, if there is selfishness in me, then we just ask that you continue to do a work in me. I don't want to withhold. I want to be obedient. I want to give because you first gave. Let me follow your example. Lord, we thank you for every good and perfect gift, for every blessing, because they are from you. We are so blessed and so rich because of you. We thank you for every good thing. In Christ's name, amen. Well, thank you for joining us this morning. Of course, you could be listening to this as an MP3 on a podcast, or you could be watching us on YouTube. There is a link or a URL up at the top. You can always clip and copy that and post it to your own uh, social media wall just to let other people know how you spent your morning, or you could post it to a friend's wall if you think it might benefit them. Don't forget to like and subscribe to this channel, and I'll see you guys next time. Bye.